I just want to, before we get started, welcome everyone into this space. I'm excited to have our panelists here to join us for this ex exciting webinar. Um, before we get started, I have this poem up on our slide right now, and I wanted to read it out loud just to set the stage for the discussion that's going to take uh, take part in today. So this is an untitled poem by Beth Strano. There is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and have caused wounds. The space seeks to turn down the volume of the world outside and amplify voices that have to fight to be heard elsewhere. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our space together and we will work on it side by side. So thank you to my colleague for sharing that one with me. I just, we decided to add that into our slide deck today. Um, I'm going to switch slides right now to start our housekeeping item. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're excited for you to join us along with Andrea Barrow, Dr. Debbie Donsky, Ben McDonald, and Dr. Vidya Shah for an hour long webinar where we'll be discussing how members within the school communities can work collaboratively to build inclusive and equitable learning experiences for all students. My name is Andrea Hayfley, and I'm a curriculum consultant here with Ophia. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Um, Ophia works across Ontario's education system in classrooms, in schools, and in school boards, working directly with educators, principals, school board leaders, public health professionals, and provincial stakeholders to bridge policy and practice, often in partnership as we're doing today. Um, please note that although the live session will be in English only, there will be a blog recap on the session and it'll be made in English and in French on our website um, in this upcoming fall. Before you know it, it will be fall. Um, okay, so I wanted to first off uh, take a moment to acknowledge the land upon which Ophia's work takes place. Ophia's work takes place on traditional Indigenous territories all across Ontario. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet and work on these territories and recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land. Um, we are aware that our settler acknowledgement uses language which may differ from language used by Indigenous peoples. Our land acknowledgement seeks to recognize the Indigenous territories where our work happens and in the true spirit of truth and reconciliation, it strives to be more than just words. By learning, understanding and acknowledging, we wish to pay respect to the rich Indigenous history of Ontario. To set the stage, I wanted to share that OFIA is committed to supporting the development of safer, more equitable, and more inclusive learning environments and would like to acknowledge Novo Nordisk for their support in funding this panel discussion today. The concepts of equity, diversity, inclusion are central to the implementation of the health and physical education curriculum. Um, and by understanding our roles in this curriculum within the school and the school community at large, we can begin to unravel how this subject area can contribute to reconciliation and achieve its goals of respecting and celebrating diversity. Recognizing that biases and perspectives are inherent in any topic leads to understanding the values, assumptions, possible motives, and underlying messages in what educators and students do and say in the school environment. As educators, I wanted to ask our participants in the room today, what steps can we take to help us reflect on our personal attitudes, biases, and values to help inform our instructional approaches and teaching strategies? Ophia is excited to share this platform today with educators, experts, and students of lived experiences who will share ideas and strategies on culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy. Where we, be, where we go from here is all up to us. Um, we thank you all for joining us today and for being part of this change. Um, without further ado, um, first off, I'd like to start introducing myself. I am a teacher in the York Region District School Board, currently on succumbent here as a health and phys ed curriculum consultant at OFIA. Um, I've been Mark. I've been part of many regional and provincial initiatives that support the HNP curriculum, healthy schools, and also the daily physical activity provincial policy. Um, I'm a strong advocate for people with disabilities and spoken at many professional learning networks, such as Hospital for Sick Kids, um, Bloorview Rehabilitation Hospital, Jumpstart Charities, and Autism Ontario. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I ask others to use these pronouns in reference to me. Um, first on my screen, I have Andrea Barrow, colleague of mine here at OFIA. Andrea, I give a wave. 
Thank you. Um, Andrea Barrow is currently the Equity and Inclusion Consultant with the Limestone District School Board in Kingston. Um, she also attended school in Peel Region. Um, she has been a secondary school, HPE, and social science teacher. For the past five years, Andrea has been part of the OFIA Safety Committee and for the past seven years, she has been an OFIA ambassador. Andrea continues to participate in a number of different communities to dismantle anti-Black racism. Most recently, she has been a writer with the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation for the Addressing Anti-Black Racism Workshop and is currently a presenter for them. So thank you, Andrea. Super excited to have you in this space today. Um, Dr. Debbie Donsky in our beautiful backyard. Debbie, give a wave. Thank you. Um, Debbie is a superintendent of education in the Toronto District School Board. Debbie has worked in several boards and at the Ministry of Education. Debbie believes that nurturing authentic relationships are key to transforming education. She has made a career focused on creating spaces of possibility, whether as an advocate, leader, writer, or artist. Love your drawings, Deb. Uh, Debbie believes that stories are what connects us. If you want to learn more, check out her website. Uh, my colleague is going to drop her blog into our chat box. So thanks, Deb, for joining us today in your beautiful yard. Um, ben McDonald. Ben, give a wave. Ben's about to head out to university, but thank you for making time for this. Very excited to have you. Um, ben is a student, an athlete, and an advocate for equity in education. After overcoming harmful experiences in the education system, Ben became committed to bridging the gap between socioeconomic status and quality of education for students and their families across Ontario. He is currently the outreach director at Minds On and is working as a logistic lead for the Minds On Durham District School board at home summer tutoring program. So welcome to have um, Ben with us here. Um, last but not least, Dr. Vidya Shah. And I have to note that Vidya and I went to high school together. So very excited that our paths have crossed again. Um, Dr. Vidya Shah is an educator, scholar, and activist committed to equity and racial justice in the service of liberatory education. She is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at York University. And her research explores anti-racist and decol decolonizing approaches to leadership in schools, communities, and also school districts. She also explores educational barriers to the success and well-being of Black, Indigenous, and racialized students. Dr. Shaw teaches in the Master of Leadership and Community Engagement, as well as undergraduate and graduate level courses in education. She has worked in the model schools for inner cities program in the Toronto District School Board and was an elementary school teacher um, in TDSB too. Dr. Shaw is committed to bridging the gaps between communities, classrooms, school districts, and the academy to reimagine, um, um, sorry, um, reimagine possibilities for schooling. Um, one thing that I really wanted to share is her work at York University, her unleading project. So my colleague's going to put that in the chat box. Um, I started listening to some of their podcasts, very engaging, um, great PD that you can access right away. Um, so hopefully you can also talk a bit more about that at the end. So very excited to get started. Um, let's start off. So last August um, in 2021, Ophia hosted a learning series in lieu of Ophia turning 100 years old. Um, our organization was able to lead these learning series for educators that provided us starting points in exploring concepts of inclusion, diversity, and equity. Um, those students can learn a great deal and respect for themselves and the differences in others. Um, our subject area, health and physical education, has played a historical role in Canada's colonialism, is implicated in racist and oppressive behaviors within the education system. Um, if you haven't attended our learning series from last summer and you wanted to read more about what we did with our folks um, in that space, uh, my colleague's going to share that um, in the chat box along with those links so you can access that. Um, I'm going to jump back and preface our conversation um, and anchor it in our health and physical education. And I wanted to share a quote um, that basically sets the stage of what we're gonna talk about. So the health and physical education curriculum is based on the vision that the knowledge and skills students acquire in the program will benefit them throughout their lives and enable them to thrive. I'm gonna say that last part again, enabling them to thrive. Um, I really wanted to share that as educators, 
for all of us in the room, we do have the opportunity to activate this vision and ensure that these goals are accessible for all of our students. Um, as the relationships that we have with our students, whether it's within the classroom or school community, and even the families that come with these students, we can really directly impact their experiences within this subject area. Um, I'm gonna start off by sharing the mic with uh, Deb. And I wanted to share our first theme. And our first theme is about unpacking equity. Um, Deb, I was wondering if you can share how your work um, who you are, your intersectional, intersectional identity, and your personal context influence what motivates your work and what you do. Sure. Um, thanks for the intro, and it's uh, nice to be here. So I identify as a white Jewish settler, cisgendered, and a woman. Um, I, um, I have to consider all of those intersecting identities when I enter into spaces. But in terms of my own experiences and that quote, Andrea, about enabling them to thrive, um, I, um, you know, when I think about my own personal experience in health and physical education class, had it not been for the health component, which I could study for and get A's, um, yeah. I probably would have failed phys ed. Um, I was repeatedly harassed, um, definitely marginalized within class, and um, silenced and humiliated. Um, so those experiences taught me about the power of educators to shift those spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, although um, recognizing on the panel, I am the only white voice, um, you know, there are entry points for white people to understand um, these experiences. And for me, um, you know, it was shame invoking and did the opposite of allowing me to thrive because what it did was it, it put me in a place as a student where as soon as I could drop phys ed, which was in grade 10 at the time, yeah. I did. And then proceeded to gain about 50 or 60 pounds up till third year university um, when a friend said, come to the gym with me. And because it was a trusting relationship, which goes back to my the bio that you read about me, yeah. I felt that I could take that risk. And, um, and since then, I have been a very active and fit person, regardless of whether or not my weight goes up and down. Yeah. So when I think about how those experiences inform what I do as an educator, I look for people who are on the margins. I look for people who are not thriving. Um, and in my call to thought that we put out last week, you know, the idea that we as educators will say, well, that child can't, um, that should be a trigger for us as educators that uh, to recognize that we can't, we don't have the skills to meet the needs of that child. Who do we have to enlist, consult, work with? Absolutely the family to understand the needs of that child and um, how we can ensure that we're creating environments that help them to thrive. Yeah, and it's, um, thank you for sharing your personal experience and in um, phys ed back when you were in elementary school and not and high school. And it when when you when you're talking, I was just thinking, okay, if a student is not being quote unquote successful, and what we define as H and P educators as successful, knowing to interrupt that, and Ben, we talked about that too, right? Knowing when to interrupt that and reflect on our own assumptions is 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 that like that that switch right where we can really make sure that and accept that there are so many diverse student popu in our in our student population with varying needs varying interests and i always use, i always like saying this with a uh, invisible emotional backpack that they have on them right as they take that first step to go into your classroom right um ben i know you felt um, really strongly in terms of sharing your experience back in school, in elementary and also high school, and sharing your, um, I guess, your intersectional identity and also your personal context and influencing what motivates what you are currently doing. Of course, of course. Thanks for having me and thanks everybody for attending. So yeah, a bit about me. Um, so yeah, I'm a Black male and what motivates my work? So in uh, public school, I would say that that's when I, so I took eight years, I spent eight years in public school and I spent four years in private school. So I found that when I was in public school, I had a much uh, tougher time, you know, um, I'm being with my treatment and coping and trying to survive. Whereas uh, private school, I felt I was really allowed to thrive. So in public school, this is what happened. So my, let's fast forward to grade five. In grade five, my teacher told me 
um, that your kind doesn't belong in university, which is crazy to think, right? At that time, I was 11 years, 11, 10, 11 years old. And then you're looking on this, this, you know, innocent kid and you're saying this. And of course, you know, I got so excited because I was like, oh, yay, no university. Right? No, life is going to be so easy now. And then yeah. I ran home and I told my parents, because, you know, what your teacher says is word. Like, oh, I don't have to go to university. Yay. And they were, they were so mad. You know what I mean? Because they're always telling me and encouraging me to pursue a degree. They have their own degrees. So, you know, they took it up with the teacher, got the principal involved and really had to talk to me about uh, racism, have those conversations at a young age. Another time that same teacher, uh, he made a comment to a white student in the class. Um, primarily the student population was black. Um, so he said to that student, you know, oh, don't hang out with those kids because one day you'll see life behind bars. And you know what I mean? Like you think you think about that in the time and you maybe you're innocent, you don't really know. But as you grow older, you think, oh, that's crazy. Like how could, that's just the craziest thing you could ever say to a child. Like why, what, what are you gaining from just holding uh, holding students back, you know what I mean? Um, another uh, occurrence, the last example I'll give is when I was in middle school at a different at a different uh, school. So I was at middle school and I was organizing a career fair. So a career fair, you know, for professionals to speak. And I had a whole bunch of professionals lined up. I had nurses, I had an attorney, justice of the peace, doctors, et cetera. Because um, then kids can ask questions. They are curious, right? And then a teacher told me, you know, this is nice, but I think the kids would identify more if you threw in some hairdressers, construction workers. So she said something like that to me. I felt a bit discouraged. But then I also figured, why are you assume making assumptions about students? That's not something you could do. Let the students decide what they want to do. Keep in mind, I, I you know, I, of course, my mom was really involved. My dad, they were both really involved in my education and were behind me. Um, really encouraging me and, you know, keeping my head on my shoulders. And I was really fortunate. I think that support system is what got me uh, through um, my public school education. And then um, I was able to bring in those professionals. And it's what motivates me to continue doing this work is because, you know, seven years later, my younger brother, he was going through the yeah. same sort of issues, right? Like, why is that? His He has and teachers. Pattern, right? Yeah, it's a pattern. He, he yeah. was, you know, a gifted student. He was going to be accepted into the gifted program. And the teacher was like, nah, I'm not signing his paper um, because he talks too much in class. You know, and then it's like, why? Maybe he's talking too much in class because he's not engaged. Maybe he isn't talking too much in class and you're being hard on him. We, didn't, we don't know. But of course, parents get involved. They speak, have a conversation with the principal. The principal deals with it. And now my brother, he's able to get, get those extra challenges and feel motivated in class. So it's really important, I think, uh, you know, for your students to be engaged in class. And yeah. um, that brings me to private private school. I found my teachers there, like they really, you know, motivated me and they yeah. gave and me And they options. were really in tune. You were telling me that they were really mm. in tune in, in your interest and your mm. need and, and what exactly. you needed from school, from education, right? Exactly. So I, I'm so appreciative for that. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you for sharing that in this space. Um, and while you were talking, I was just thinking about, um, I guess, a comment that was made um, in the blog post for when we were uh, doing the learning series with shifting the narrative in H and PE, um, and just imagine what a H and PE program might look like, where the narrative comes from and authentically represents our the needs and the interests of our learners. Right, whether you are white, black, whatever culture you come from, disability, um, non-disabled, what mindset would positively impact the overall well-being of our students. Um, Andrea, I know you wanted to speak to this, and I was wondering if you can share um, the work you're doing, and not just about that, but how does who you are, your intersectional identity, and your personal context influence what motivates what you are currently doing in your school board? Thanks. Um, and I want to thank Deb and, and Ben for sharing. Uh, ben, it's interesting to, to hear directly from a source. We see the stats and the data all the time and, and people may make a bit of a disconnect and to see and hear um, is it, it's 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 upsetting. And, and same with Deb as, uh, as well. And, and unfortunately, we hear these stories far too many times. So um, I'm, I'm Andrea Barrow and I grew up in the uh, Peel region. So I went to school in Mississauga and Brampton. Um, at the time when I was there, they both communities were predominantly white. Um, and then I went on to university at Queens and um, similar to what Ben was saying in terms of what 
guidance was being given to me was not necessarily the university path, right? So we're talking a, a few decades ago, um, was not necessarily the university path and other options were being presented, but, you know, advocated for myself and parents pushed me forward as well and landed in Kingston. Um, again, predominantly uh, at Queen's University, a white university. So I never had... Um, in my years of university or school, a black teacher or a black professor and raised in a community and a sense that my proximity to whiteness would equal success. And, you know, part of that, part of me wonders sometimes in listening to some of your stories that because all my friends were, were, were white and that's where they were going to university, that kind of led me in that direction as well, in terms of what my parents were pushing me towards as well. So in my current role, I've been um, a health and physical education teacher for probably 10 to 15 years. And my most current role right now is an equity and inclusion consultant with the Limestone District School Board. What excites me about this position is that I actually feel like I have a voice and a seat at the table to make some changes. And in the short period of time that I'm there, I'm seeing things moving forward. And we have a senior management team that wants to make these changes. Um, I feel like I've, I've got a job to do to be the voice for other black and brown students, um, you know, being a racialized black woman um, in the community as well, and making sure that my own children are being heard. And that like Andrea, what you said, the programs need to fit the needs of our learners. Mm -hmm. I think that we're traditionally trying to do things that we've done for so many decades. It doesn't necessarily work. The demographics have changed in terms of who's in front of us and the eyeballs that we see, and we need to adapt and meet those needs. I think what happens a lot is that as educators, we have what we like to teach and who we like to teach and how we like to teach it. And we don't adapt and open up to um, other ways of doing things and embracing things. And that just sort of contributes to um, some of the, the racism that we'll see um, in HPE uh, classes. Thank you. Um, Vidya, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to, to address our first theme about un unpacking equity. And I know this is your jam. Um, how does who you are, your intersectional identity, and also your personal context influence what motivates the work you're doing in your space? Sure. Thanks so much, uh, Andrea and Ophia, for hosting this important session. And uh, thank you so much to Deb and to Ben and to, to Andrea for sharing your stories and your perspectives. Um, I, I come to this, I guess, all, all conversations as a, a cisgender, heterosexual, South Asian woman, um, and also how I define as a colonized settler in Toronto. And so lineages of uh, colonization on both sides of my families, uh, and also a settler here in, in, in Toronto. And uh, and also as a former classroom teacher and now a professor. And, you know, I think about um, my own experience as sort of in schooling and all kinds of, of, of exclusion, being, being brown, uh, being in a larger body, um, you know, all, all kinds of things that, that I've experienced. And I also think about, you know, my time in the school board, um, the experiences that I would see of so many educators who, you know, we often talk about how students are excluded in these spaces, but I often think about how educators are also excluded in these spaces. And that doesn't stop once we become the educator in the classroom. And so racism and, you know, patriarchy and cis heteropathy, all these things continue to operate and affect us all, um, regardless of whether we're students or educators or we're talking about families and communities. And so one of the things I think that, you know, um, Andrew, you were speaking about the Unleading Project, one of the reasons that uh, I really come to that work is because of this, of the importance that I place on the theory, uh, on the connection between theory and practice. And so, you know, I, I remember being in grad school and learning about all these theories and then being in a school at the same time and thinking there's a disconnect here between what I'm learning and what I'm seeing and how are people sort of making sense of this connection. And so one of the reasons that we that we launched this podcast series was to, to help with that exact thing. And I think one of the things I've learned from that the most is that there's this, the importance of um, we as educators need to, need to undo and unlearn and un, uh, un, undo the ways that we've learned to lead, to teach, to learn, because we have been socialized given our various social identities. We've, we've learned about the world. We've learned about who we are, what our place is in the world, what is possible in the world. We've learned how, how people read us in the world. And until we really take time to be 
uh, in the reflection of that and to undo some of the stuff that we've been taught, both the sort of oppressive messages that we've that we've that we've uh, internalized, but also the dominant, like you know, the, the 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 dominance that we've internalized. So, for example, as a cisgender heterosexual uh, woman, what what ideas have I internalized about gender and sexuality that fit, you know, you know, heterosexual uh, cisgender normatives that that are not true for all. How do I how do I make a space yeah. for myself to undo the very learning that has allowed me to experience the world in a way that uh, lines up with or fits my particular gender identity and sexual orientation? So you know I I I think this this call to thought which I love that Ophia is doing it's it's also a call to unthought right it's it's a call to how do we undo what we have. Uh, been socialized into and be really aware of who we are so that, you know, I really love what Deb said about, about relationships so that we can be in relation with people that is more and more liberatory and freeing and emancipatory. No, thank you. And as you were speaking, even just in, in the back of my mind, I'm flashing back of just navigating the educational system for my daughter who is disabled and understanding that I myself uh, am able-bodied, I am not disabled, but understanding that people can experience oppression in various and very different ways. But in the end, the, the common theme when all each of you were talking was, how do we create that physical and emotional safety, uh, safe environment for all of our learners so that they can be who they are um, unapolo unapologetically in our classrooms, right? And not just in H and PE, right? Um, this flows right into our second theme. Um, and I just wanna preface it with some context in the curriculum. When we talk about the fundamental principles of our curriculum, one of them is on physical and emotional safety as a precondition for effective learning in this subject area. So when we talk about that, um, what does that look, sound, and feel like? And then each of you have shared your personal experiences in terms of how you felt comfortable or not comfortable in the spaces growing up in elementary school, high school, and what you observe in your own school communities at large. Um, our first question that I, and I wanna throw it back to Vidya because it flows right into what you were just saying. Um, thank you for sharing and um, what you observed, what you're experiencing in your current role in the education sector. But I wanted to jump to um, the topic of assumptions. Right now we're gonna be talking about um, culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, but digging deeper in terms of what does that mean for each of us in our own roles? Um, how do assumptions impact how we teach and or build relationships with our colleagues and with students? If you can build on that, um, that would be wonderful because it kind of leads into what you were just saying in our first theme. Right. So, you know, I mean, I, I think about the work of Gloria Latson Billings here um, and actually relevant teaching in particular. And this notion, uh, you know, the first notion of student success. And I think about, you know, who, who meets with success in the health and physical education classroom and who does not? How do we define success? What does that even mean? How do our definitions of success limit who can actually thrive in, in, in that space? Who could actually grow and learn and show up in their full selves in that space? You know, I, I think a lot about in the in that second tenet around around cultural competence. There's a lot of examples of schools that are starting starting to really think about, you know, how are how how does our student population relate to the kinds of activities that we're doing? You know, so there's 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 a lot of schools that are opening up cricket fields or that are you know doing yoga in various ways or all sorts of all sorts of examples of sort of culturally relevant ways to think about honoring how physical education takes place in the home and community of the children that are that are that are in that space and in that school. And I think that's super important. Um, but I, I want to touch on what I feel is that the tenet of culturally relevant uh, teaching that often goes under uh, under that, that is often underexplored. And for me, that's the critical consciousness piece. And so I ask myself, who does not belong in the physical in, in our health and physical education classrooms? Who does not belong? Who does not feel that they have a place, a, a place there? And I think about how things like social class influences who can and cannot participate, the cost of, of you know, participating in, in, in particular events in, in, in health and phys ed classes, um, the, the kinds of clothes that, 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 that the children might wear and how they can show up in classrooms in ways that they feel that, 
you know, regardless of, of what they have access to, there is a space for them here. I think as well about disability and children with a, a range of disabilities, mm-hmm. um, f- like physical disabilities, but also intellectual disabilities. And so in what ways are we making space for children to um, to be able to, to, to show up and to provide uh, different access points into activities so that they can still participate, um, albeit differently. And so much of that is decentering any sort of norm, like any, you know, this is what uh, this looks like. When we can decenter this idea of, of a norm or a standard or criteria um, that is so narrow, many more students have access to that and many more students can, can experience success. I think it's well about gender and gendered relations and, you know, children that are that are uh, transitioning or children that, you know, think of change rooms, think of all the activities we do where we think is a big one, right? Yeah, exactly. Uniforms, just even different sports teams. In all these ways, the the the, the reproducing of gendered norms and ideas is really um, quite harmful for a lot of students. And even if 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 a student identifies as as, as straight, as cisgender, it's it's damaging for all of us to be in these very narrow binaries around what it means for gender and sexu- sexuality. I think about things like fat phobia and shaming and how that plays a role. I think about religious accommodations. You know, I think about how rampant Islamophobia is in, uh, in health and phys ed classrooms because people don't, many people just may not understand what a religious accommodation looks like um, in a way that is sort of supportive of the student. And I think about racism, which is huge and rampant. And, and I know in our in our pre-conversation, um, Ben sort of mentioned this, and I hope that he'll speak to it again, but just this idea of, of who is expected to be successful in a health and phys ed classroom. And what does that expectation do to the rest of the students? So if they're expected to be successful in a health and phys ed class, does that mean that they're not expected to be successful in other realms of their schooling? And so thinking about the ways that even as we are propping up these notions of success, uh, that it, 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 it's actually quite harmful because it limits the expression and the possibility for these students in a wide range of their, of their experiences. So I'll pause there, Andrea, and uh, if we want to come back later, have some. some yeah, more. no, I, as you were, it, it goes to the importance of designing these inclusive spaces, right? And, and the strong need for our for everyone, not just the teachers in the classrooms, the support staff, the students themselves, the administrators, the vibe of the whole school, the need for us to be reflective and um, humble in in learning how to be opening to learning, right? And and have these trusting relationships. Um, One thing, I'm gonna share the mic with Ben, but I wanted to um, highlight something um, in a recent blog post that Deb was a guest blogger for um, our last one. Um, And she asked this one question in the blog post and check it out, my colleague's gonna put that in the chat box. What if we centered ability rather than only seeing the deficit lens of limits? And I love that, right? It, It catches me when I read that because like what you said, Vidya, when someone doesn't belong, we need to catch that. What's happening? What we did last year is not going to work this year. And I'm going to share the mic with Ben, if you can um, just speak to in terms of how do assumptions impact how we teach or how we build relationships with our students um, and even colleagues. Um, I'll share the mic with you, Ben. For sure. Thanks. Um, thank you, Vidya. Thanks, Andrew. I think definitely is really important not to make not to make assumptions, not to put students into boxes, because students have many interests, right? I was, so I was always very involved in athletics, you know, a whole slew of athletics, but I was also very involved in academics and things like spelling bees. So, you know, there shouldn't be one lens to look at a, a student. I think one of the, uh, a great example, a great uh, example I have for a teacher who really um, helped me with that was my university counselor. So when I was applying to university from um, grade 12, I think, um, so she, I told her about, you know, my desire to do varsity sports during, uh, during, um, during university. I wanted to do varsity sports, but I still wanted to make sure I got my degree. I was chasing, you know, my uh, path to my, my master's and then one day hopefully med school. So I, I, I asked for those options and rather than, you know, telling me where to go, like, oh, focus on this or focus on this, she listened to uh, what is it that I wanted. And then she was able to give me the options, give me... Um, what paths I can take, um, what courses I can take, which schools offer these things, you know, so I really thought that was very helpful in terms of um, that. And she also got my uh, parents involved. So they had an understanding of the 
of the uh, how the how the systems work and what options I have. I think um, one of the things I would like to uh, just highlight quickly is um, sometimes we have this thing called streaming that happens, and streaming is when students are put into a certain uh, grade level or, or or box that they should they should take this certain subject level, and it might be you might have standard level math, but then you have might have a a lower level of math that people might assume. And I think one of the reasons, now I would like to tie back to the parents. One of the reasons mm -hmm. a lot of parents might not realize that students are being streamed is because of culture. So for example, I am half Jamaican. So in, in Jamaican, let's say applied math, it, the, the term was applied math and applied math is the standard level of math that you use to get into university. On the other hand, then applied math in Ontario, applied math somewhere else could mean a lower level of math. So, you know, the parents might think, oh, my student is in applied math and that's great but then now the student is streamed into this position and then they realize they can't get into like the life science degree that i applied for right they can't get into you know an accounting degree or degrees that require a certain level of high school math and i think uh, a reason for that is because the students aren't aware the parents aren't aware and then of course there's the assumption that shoved uh, the student um into that position so i really think making sure the child is educated and even getting the parents involved so that they can also help their kid and then working as a community with the parents as well, I think is a great way um, to uh, proceed with that. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing. And, and as I always say, the families that, that, um, and caregivers that also are attached to the students that we see every day have so much and may know a lot more that can help us in the classroom and in our schools in terms of bridging that gap and understanding where these students come from to ensure that we provide them the opportunities for them to be um, enjoy the, enjoy the whole the whole everything that this program can offer and beyond in the school community. Um, Andrea, I'm going to share the mic with you if you can um, address in terms of what Ben was saying in terms of assumptions, but also share from your perspective in your leadership role in your board. So yeah, the assumptions, right? Like the, there's different assumptions in terms of academically what students can do. And then there's assumptions that we make um, athletically what students could do as well, right? So we um, we have some biases there. We really need to check our biases. Um, we need to really take it, it take a look in terms of where we're placing students or where we think we're placing students. One of the things that I'm trying to work on right now is taking a look at um gendered versus non-gendered phys ed classes and trying to get our head around in terms of like, does this meet the needs of our students? Because like in our board in grade nine, we have all girls and all boys phys ed. And that's quite limiting for students. And, and Viv, I think you mentioned as well, um, video that, that the change room situation, right? We're looking like, so we've started with looking at bathrooms and I think most school boards are looking at that as well, but we also have to look at the change rooms and that the change rooms are not a safe space. And when we have um, gendered classes, um, we're not creating necessarily a safer environment for students. And we have a lot of students that end up not taking that mandatory phys ed and being exempt from it. And it could be a, a, a wonderful opportunity for them if it was created to meet their needs. So that was one of the things that, you know, that the, the gendered, the norms that you were speaking about as well, the limitations around clothing and religious accommodations. And it's one thing that the teacher may not necessarily truly understand the religious accommodations that's required. And if they're not understanding that, then the peers or the, the other students are not understanding that as well. So again, what kind of environment are we creating? We need to gain that additional knowledge. This is a, a role as an educator that you just don't go to teacher's college and, you, and you're done. You're, yeah. You've got a passion for learning, but we also have to realize that as eight, um, health and physical education teachers, we were most likely the varsity athletes the jocks, right? And so that, it, so it's sometimes it's difficult to see students that are may not be as athletic to help find a way to bring them along. So, you know, not everyone's going to play basketball. Maybe they want to lift weights. Maybe they want to do yoga. Maybe they want to do a sport that is um, near and dear to the heart in terms of where they came from. So we need to create different environments. So we talk about um, culturally relevant pedagogy, but it needs to be sustainable. It's not one and done. So I think everyone else has brought some really um, some good points to the table, but we need to find ways to support our students. And front and foremost, we need to check our bias and dismantle that. No, oh, thank you. And when when as you were speaking, it's almost like how do we create this space for everyone to be comfortable, for everyone not just to be be successful, but be comfortable, right? So that they can take risk. Like I think about Deb, what you were sharing. 
you, your friend asked you, Hey, do you want to go to the gym? Do you want to move? What was that inclination to say yes versus no? And when you think back when you were in school, it was a hard no, right? And, and, and how, how do we create that physical and emotional safety so that students can see themselves reflected in the curriculum? I'm going to share the mic with you because I know that we talked a lot about this in terms of what inclusion, diversity, equity can look, sound, and feel like in our classrooms, schools, and school boards. And I'm just looking at the notes that you shared with me. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you talk to this. I don't want to take over the mic too much. <laughs> I just, I want to just draw on something Ben said. He said that yeah. the, the, the person asked him what his goals were. I think this is so central to health and physical education class. It, every class that when we determine what a child needs, they know what they need. They know we watch the body language. If a child is sitting on the side or holding back, um, you know, my friend who brought me in, she knew I was a swimmer. Um, I always joke that swimming was easy for me because I was very buoyant. Um, but but that was a safe place for me to enter. And that turned into fitness classes. And that turned into weight training. And that turned into many other things that I do consistently now and alter through my week. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, uh, Bill, Bill Crothers in York Region. I remember I had many students that went there when I was the prin a principal in York Region. And there's a choice to join that school under the wellness program. What if somebody in health and phys ed just wanted to work on their own wellness and fitness rather than competition and sport? There are many things that we can do to be active. So I think what, what Ben talked about was that the student has to be central when we make these decisions. Um, I don't know if that answers the question um, that you're asking me, uh, but I also, you know, I also think about, I'm like many over COVID joined the Peloton cult um, and Christine uh, Deckerel made this comment once in one of her classes. She said, you know, she always wanted to be a runner and she was always very much aware that she had a larger, um, lower half, let's call it, call it that. And what she came to understand that was her sport was cycling. And she wins all kinds of awards. And that's something that her body naturally moved into. And then she gained strength. So um, to Andrea's point, not everybody's going to play basketball. I could get, I could shoot a hoop every single time because I had a colleague who coached the York University girls basketball team. She, he taught me how to shoot a basket. I, no one ever taught me that. So I think that there's many phys ed classes where we assume people come with the skill, which goes back to what Vidya spoke about around the cost of being trained in a lot of these sports that people have access to, whereas others do not. Um, whether it's financial, whether it's time, whether they have jobs they have to do, whether they have families that can drive them to these competitions. Um, you know, I think that there are so many things that feed into and it's central. Going back to your original quote, around allowing people to thrive. And I think about that, that Learning 100 series, I think that's what you said it was called, and the Indigenous perspective around what was central in terms of health and physical education was central to how they lived in the world. And it built skills so they could move through the world in functional and um, communal ways. And so it has to be beyond the gym floor. It has to be, how do we live our lives and what are we doing to ensure that? I know, I think I also wrote about the fact that, and many of us, you know, I have aging parents. Um, my parents were always active. My father now has severe dementia and zero mobility, but I still exercise with him. And when I exercise with him, then he can talk to me a little bit more. The physical movement prompts his own brain to engage in ways that if he was sedentary, it would not. So whether we're talking early in life in a kindergarten classroom or what a life of physical activity means as we near the end of our life, it's an essential component to our well-being and to um, limit a child's ability to move in the world and be strong is a, is a significant disservice that we do as educators. No, thank you. And that quote that I mentioned at the beginning should anchor us, right? And, and, and that buzzword, thrive. What does the curriculum want our, our students to, to learn? And how do we anchor that learning to meet their needs, their, their connections, 
And how do we build those relationships so that they have the confidence and the confidence to, to like you, right? You're in your 50 something and, and you will say, yes, you want to try it, right? Versus someone in grade 10. Oh, forget that. I'm going to drop this as fast as I can, right? Um, I'm going to make sure that we have enough time to go into our last theme and also address the questions that were coming into our Q&A. Um, so what now what? This is our third theme. Let's talk about next steps, resources, and strategies. Um, I'm going to throw the mic back to Ben um, because you shared something really valuable um, when we were pre-planning for this webinar. How can educators interrupt their own biases and the impact of these biases that may have on their students and also in their school community? Yeah, for sure, definitely. Um, now that we, we know what to look for, right? We know how to stop, we know how to prevent it, or at least take the steps to getting there. I think that it is uh, important now that we get involved in the community where you teach, right? Get involved, um, have conversations with community members, um, ask what, what are their needs, right? What, what do they want, right? How can you help, right? And when you have those conversations, you're better able to navigate the spaces and, you know, access uh, those students, right? Uh, one teacher, she gave an example where, you know, she, uh, she had, a, there was an amazing student in her class and um, on one occasion, she was at the mall and he was a black student. And um, when she saw this kid and based on his dress, she got kind of um, scared of the student. And when he came closer, she was like, oh, my goodness, that is, you know, Timmy or, or whatever, you know. And then she felt really bad that she had made those assumptions about him. And then she herself committed to, you know, just making sure she was more aware and more involved in the communities, you know, so that uh, they can make those uh, steps to positivity and improvement and equity together. Yeah. Thank you. And and I value your your youth voice as you are calling in and I'm reading the in the chat and also the Q and A's that are coming in on, on our side that you're calling in well your voice is calling in the boards, organizations, educators in this room that Yes, we are committed to make the change. Where does it start? What does it look like? Um, and you mentioned something really important and recognizing our biases and perspectives. We all inherently have that, right? And being able to catch that so that when we are choosing our games, choosing our activities, figuring out our planning, how we're addressing our students, how we're creating that environment is um, ensuring that it impacts our students and the community in a positive way, right? Um, Vidya, would you like to speak? I was wondering if you can share as educational leaders, how might we understand, um, I guess, these concepts in regards to equity-centered practices, what you were speaking in regards to culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy, help us address the main many inequities and intersections in our school communities. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrea. You know, I think one of the things that's most important as we do this work is to question everything, everything. We're questioning what is health, what is physical education, what is health and physical education, what is what are the preconceived notions that we have around all of these things. So the more that we can question, even what is safety. You know, we I, I love the the poem that you shared at the beginning, um, and I use that I use that poem a lot in my. Mm -hmm. in webinars and workshops that I do. And one of the things I always say is that there is no such thing as a safe space. It doesn't exist. Because anytime we declare that there's a safe space, anyone who doesn't feel safe in that space doesn't feel like they can share that they don't feel safe because we've already declared that it's a safe space. And so what if instead we supported educators and leaders in developing the awareness and the lens to continuously scan for who does not feel safe and comfortable in this space. And so that it becomes a process that is ongoing and we're continually bringing more and more people into that space. So there isn't an end point. So we need to challenge this, this idea that this is what it looks like. And part of that is resisting the traditional ways that we've done things before. And so resisting the fact that health and phys physical education needs to be a place that is, you know, a competitive space, that is a that is an individualistic space. You know, what about what about group and collective movement? What about you know, other ways of thinking about being well that don't involve individual competition, as, as Deb was sharing earlier. And I think as well about, you know, so many times in, in health and phys ed, we need to challenge this idea that there are some students that are literally just disposable, that we're not going to invest in, that we're not going to put time and attention into because they just can't cut it athletically, right? And how do we, and that, that's rampant in a lot of health and phys ed spaces. How do we challenge that? And in doing so, how do we center 
uh, knowledge systems and ways of, of knowing and being that um, have really been sidelined, have really been silenced in health and physical education. Um, somebody in the chat uh, mentioned the importance of um, Indigenous perspectives of movement as medicine, you know, how important that is to recenter um, ways of thinking and being and action and movement that are part of the global majority that maybe have not made their ways into um, our Ontario classrooms, but we have children from the global majority and educators from the global majority in, in these classrooms. And of course, they're being careful not to engage in that sort of cultural appropriation, right? I, I talk about this all the time, the Lululemon um, yoga nonsense that's happening in the world right now. And I, I can't, it's like, it's a new form of capitalism. It's a new form of, you know, new age spirituality. And really, like, this is the movement practices of my people, like my ancestors. And I'm watching it take hold on the grand scale in North America and thinking, wow, we are completely erased from that conversation. Um, and then I think about the importance of imagining new possibilities uh, for what, what health and physical education spaces might, might be. And I think about what might it look like for all students to know and be in awe of their physical selves, for all students to have beautiful relationships to their bodies and to reclaim and re-engage the deep connections between their bodies, their minds, their spirits, and between themselves and all of life that surrounds them. And so I wonder how we might reimagine a health and physical space that allows for that deep reflection, that deep love, that deep care, that deep wellness, um, that is our inherent birthright. No, it's, wow. Like, thank you. Thank you for sharing all this. And, and as you were speaking, it reminded me of a, of a time when my son came to me and, and he was like, how come my my sister can't come to my school. And um, because she's disabled, I had to explain that. But also he didn't understand how kids like her couldn't be in a space with him at school when it's a very public space. But then on the weekend, when we go to the other spaces, such as, um, I guess, um, our Bloorview community or in Brody Village, everyone is included. So he right now he's at a stage where he's grappling over that. And, and I always tell him, ask questions. It never hurts to ask questions. And, and as you were talking, it reminded me, how do we interrupt systems such as education, not just an HNPE that favor certain groups, abilities over others? Um, Andrea, I want to make sure I'm looking at the time right now, if you can make sure that you share your perspective in terms of your role and in, um, in regards to so what now what and also addressing the question that came into the Q&A. Okay, um, so I've been looking at the chat and so many great conversations. I wish we had another hour. I completely agree with some of the things that are in the chat in terms of Ted talking about fitness being you know, a major component and Deb talking about movement and, and video talking about movement. Uh, I think we need to go beyond the traditional sport-based phys ed that we're always offering. We need to go beyond power fit for boys, live fit for girls, dismantle that. We've dismantled that in, in the school that I was in before. And our numbers actually went up in terms of having classes focused on personal fitness. We need to bring in more of the cultural aspect to it as well. So talking about other sports like cricket, yes, Cricket can be complicated. My parents are Bayesian. They're from Barbados. I still don't fully understand it, but doesn't mean that I can't do it and I can't teach it. I can rely on other people to do it as well, to make other students feel um, welcome in the space. I agree. We could never have a safe space, but, but we could move in the direction of having a safer space in terms of what we offer and having students move. And we want them to be lifelong learners and be passionate about moving and being healthy beyond the traditional ways of looking at things as well. Um, I, I'm going to be conscious of time as well. Um, so one of, there was a couple of questions that came up that I think you wanted me to address in terms of public health nurses and how they could assist and help with this area as well. A lot of these students, a lot of our students um, our mental health, right? We can rely on our public health nurses to support students um, in a culturally responsive way in terms of mental health. Larger communities and centers will be probably better focused for that than say smaller communities. But I know that say, for example, black mental health needs a different approach. Different communities needs a different approach and not all parents will be on the same page. And then the other question came up as well um, about um, sports in terms of track and field. I believe that I saw there as well in terms of a student selecting you know girls or boys 
that sort of comes back now to OFSA. And I know that they're looking at that in terms of allowing students to select and compete um, in the division that reflects their lived experience. And the trickle down effect, I know at our board as well, is that our regional um, uh, guidelines are changing towards that as well. I, I'm trying to be mindful because I see that it's 11. Um, so just let me know if there's anything else that you wanted me to address. No, oh, good. All good. Um, ben, I know you wanted to share something and build off of what Andrea is saying. We'll keep it short and sweet and then we'll um, end off. But um, I want to make sure that you have the platform too, Ben. Go for it. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, everyone. I just wanted to, quick note, I wanted to encourage everyone to read upon the takeover at the Peel Board and how the Ontario Board of Education, they appointed a supervisor to take over the PDSB after it failed to address systemic anti-Black racism. And it's an amazing story of trustees and community members who persevere despite all the odds. You know, this included being bullied, being silenced, and community members being wrongfully issued trespass letters, accusing them of intimidation and making threats, you know? And despite the corruption, the community rallied together, which resulted in the Ministry of Education actually stepping in to assure that Black students were being treated fairly. So that's a great uh, case for people to be aware of. You know, PDSB is a huge board, so. Yeah, no, thank you, Ben. And I really like how you were calling in um, the people that are in this room right now that it's so valuable to make sure that we take the time to examine our, not just our, our, our school's beliefs, but our personal beliefs and identifying our potential biases that we hold in the spaces that we are leading. Um, our panelists have shared some amazing resources on our participant handout. So uh, my colleague will drop the participant handout in the chat box too. The QR code is also on your screen and the link um, and also the participant survey for you. So please take a moment to share this. Um, this is our first time being able to um, have such an engaging uh, conversation about this topic and hopefully we will be able to do more of this. So we would love to hear your feedback. Um, and last but not least, our last slide. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, everyone in the room also know that Ophia has launched our redesigned website. Um, so make sure that you create your free account um, as all Ophia clients will be required to do that. Um, and we also welcome everyone to stay connected on the e-connection and also follow us on our social media handles. Um, please note that once again, this webinar is being recorded. And as I mentioned, a recap blog will be developed to summarize all all the discussions from today and both of these will be provided for all of the registrants next month. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to our educators along with the panelists, Andrea, Deb, Ben, and Vidya for your time, expertise, and energy. And thank you to all the participants in the room. Um, Ophia values so much of our um, what you do for our organization and beyond. Um, and we also value your ongoing commitment and equity and inclusion in your own spaces to value the student voices that are in your school communities and also partnering with communities to empower educators like us to support the well-being of all of our children. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone for uh, slotting out of your uh, summertime to join us today. Um, we'll be online for a little bit, but have a great afternoon and um, we'll just give a final wave to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.